I've decided that I just want to spend the rest of my life just hanging out with you. Because this is the coolest dude I have ever met in my life. I heard the stories, I heard the rumors, they are all true. <laughs> On top of that, he was a pretty good soccer player back in his day. From 1970 to 73, he scored 44 goals. He was drafted by the New York Cosmos of the North American Soccer League. His Blackbird teams over those years had a record of 37 wins, four losses, and five ties. 37, four, and five is remarkable. And he was the leading goal scorer on those teams. We were the number one team in the New York region all those years. We had a powerhouse team and some of his teammates from that team are here today. I don't want to take too much time up here because, believe me, this is the man you want to hear speak. So John, if you're ready, John Stavros. I don't normally make speeches unless my art department is with me because, uh, you know, if you look at this photo here, that was 1972. Hair is still there. <laughs> so, at the end of the night, if you want to hear more stories, just join me. But right now I'm going to be serious because I'm really quick, you know, just the way I used to play the game. Quick, fast, furious, go all about and just win. And that's all I'm known for. And at the age of 63, still, when I came here at the alum, uh, alumni LIU game in October, our side was losing 7-0. I started telling the young kids from the 90s, hey, I'm in your team, you know? And Mickey Kaidis all of a sudden realized, like, you know, he's got to give me the ball because we need to tie the game. In a matter of two minutes, boom, 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 three passes, three goals, whatever. So I guess we're still happening. Now, uh, again, to be uh, serious, I'm going to uh, first start with, I want to uh, let everyone know that it's a great honor for me to receive this, okay? I call this my colors. In football, we call this our colors. Some people know football as soccer. I go back and I call it football. I want to thank the athletic director, John Suarez, was taking me back. I want to thank the assistant athletic director, Greg Fox, who I fell in love with. So does my whole table over there. Uh, the members of the board, all the professors from the past and the present, and most importantly, current athletes and students that are part of this great institution. Okay? I'd like to take this opportunity to propose, first of all, that LIU Sports should be played with professional contracts. That would mean after 44 years, I would still be here playing soccer or football. I think that's a great idea. We probably would have created the biggest dynasty in the United States or the world if they would have allowed us to play for 44 years in this institution. Okay, so growing up, growing up, I only knew three meccas. In football, we call them Meccas. The Mecca of soccer, as we all know, is Brazil. Second Mecca, you might not know it, is only like two miles away, maybe two and a half miles, and it's called Metropolitan Oval. And the third Mecca, to me, is LIU. Okay? From the 60s to the 90s, LIU was considered the Mecca of soccer to many of us. So, in the 60s, LIU gave us the legends, my day, and I still am friends to this day with many of them, okay? Carlo Tramatosi, Doug Marcus, Arnie Ramirez, Jerry Klevecka, Joe Majnik, Mickey Cohen, Ronnie Yabush, I played with them, and they're still part of our team as the 60s. 
That's just to name a few. I might have forgotten a few more. And I know Arnie and Carlo will say, you forgot about what's his name, Rosenthal or whatever other. So to move on, let's just give those legends a round of applause. Now, you all want to know how I got here. I didn't take Nicole's shoes, by the way. But at the end of the night, I'm going to take our shoes. <laughs> uh, how I got here is a very interesting story, okay? Um, as a rebellious teenager, thanks to George Kazantzis over there, who took me from uh, a team called Hoda Bavarians and hooked me up with a team called German Hungarians. If I didn't have him, I would probably be, you know, at NYU with Arnie or some other university in another place. But I took off from the United States because I didn't think there was any money in the game. So Argentina is where I ended up in 1970. And I trained there with Boca Juniors and some of the other top teams. And there was a professor here, teacher actually, coach at that time, Alan Young, who kept sending me love letters, or during those years we used to call them peace letters, that you need an education. Because if you're not going to be Pelé, you need to come back and get an education. And thank God I did come back and got an education. Because that to me is the most important thing that LIU ever gave me, an education. Because we were during the rebellious times, the revolutions were going on all around us. I remember out the parking lot where all of a sudden kids were getting killed in Kent University. And we were like, I can't run. Because I'm wearing high heels, you know. I'd be coming down here with portfolios and satin suits and platform shoes, and I had to fight for survival. And that was like the beginning of what we call the revolution that we created here. And Alan Young convinced me to come back from Argentina, and I met this, what I call, my homies in the 70s. John Grasser, Rosario Composto, who's not here, Cisco, Rovito, Bobby Yacano, Phil, Freddie Weber, they're all here, you know, Raymond Wallace, they're all here. This, there were seven or eight of us that came in and we called ourselves lovers, you know. I don't know why, <laughs> but. We played the game like it was love, you know? We just passed the ball around. I used to give them $10 to give it to me so I score an extra goal, you know? But that's the way it was. We were a band of lovers. And in my freshman year, I remember when Alan Young said, you take the first penalty against UConn University. And I still remember that image. I go, you kidding me, coach? You want me to take the penalty? Take the penalty. I nailed it, you know? Just boom. And that year, it was, it was easy to score goals because like, there was nobody else that wanted to score goals. So moving on from the 70s, what happened was we just kept winning. We won. 71, the team got better. 72, the team got better. 73, the team got better. All we did is just kept winning. But it was hard for us to promote the game because during that time it wasn't fashionable to playing this game played by foreigners, which is what I was. I learned how to play the game sewing my own soccer balls, because we didn't have money to buy a soccer ball. We had no shoes. I didn't even know what a pair of soccer shoes was till George came back from Germany one day and he showed me, you know, shoes, soccer shoes. So, it wasn't cool to be playing soccer in the 70s all these revolutions going on around. We had the Vietnam War, if you remember. So, being born in Greece, practicing with a homemade soccer ball, I definitely fitted that image of a foreigner. So I came to LIU, and along the way, I decided to start wearing leopard print pants and high heels and shoot crap with the brothers down the block because I was carrying a portfolio. And I 
remember one time I even took the Myrtle subway. There was a train back there. We used to take the train. <laughs> Those were the hip years, guys. Those were the years that if you were here from 70 to 74, there was no David Beckham. There was no Jay-Z. Okay. So, Nicole, I want your shoes at the end of the night. But most important, LIU is like the brothers and the ladies before me said, what I love about it is that it gives the love to the athletes that beyond the recognition that we received on the field, to me this is an honor that I get this recognition more than what I've done in the 60 years of my life, playing the game, promoting the game. Very few people here know that in 1977, when I graduated at LIU, in 74, I was probably the youngest soccer coach at Hunter College for seven years, and I took that program to another level. In 1977, John Avelson, the director of the movie Rocky, says his wife came to me and said, John, start a female soccer program. So I formed the first female soccer team in 1977, comprised of models and actresses. Ten years before the United States Football Federation ever put a penny into a female soccer program. Those things I do not want to talk about. The history of the game is right there, again, the legends. I want to thank everyone for an amazing honor. And I am very proud to be here. And now, I want to get out of here quick. So I'm going to finish it up by simply... Notice? There was a gentleman here that also told me about my body. I had no idea that the body, the mind, and the spirit, and the soul. So we had a guy in the basement down here that whenever I would miss a goal, he would just like twist my legs, twist my arms, take a knife and go like this and tell me, you know, look how strong I am. Nothing can penetrate this arm. I go, you're unbelievable, dude. His name was Dr. Turner. He taught me a lot, man. That guy taught me a lot. Our second coach in our junior and senior year, if you remember, Johnny, we lost our coach and we had uh, a gymnastic coach by the name of Daniel Burke, which we loved. He was like our brother. So Daniel Burke is not here, but he was something special to me. He made me captain, co-captain on my junior and senior year. And in my senior year, how can I score like 17 goals as a fresh sophomore? 10 goals as a junior, and then all of a sudden my ratings went down. That's because Daniel says, I need you to play the middle. And so, all of a sudden, the scoring went down. But Daniel Berg was a special person in this institution. The other, what we called during those years was a freaky dude. His name was Dr. I could never pronounce it, Dr. Stretchovich, if I remember. <laughs> Who remembers Dr. Stretchovich? It, it was like in one of those buildings where the professors used to sleep, and we go like, I'm not going over there. <laughs> so like, we're, he's, he's hooking me up. Like, I mean, I'm going, what are you doing to me? Like, sticking electric things here? And I started like feeling good, you know, like electric stimulation. <laughs> My hair kept growing, you know? <laughs> So, that guy, Dr. Stretchovich, and whoever remembers him, the guy was a genius. He, he, he kind of like calculated that, that my body at that age was sort of probably considered as one of the most athletic human beings that he ever tested on. He didn't know that I was like going, I like it, you know, electric shocks. So I kept going back to him, you know. So,